Hallelujah. Glory to God. Welcome to Wednesday night service at Abundant Grace Church. We're glad you guys are joining us in person and you guys via live stream. So, you know, I say this every week, set this time aside. You know, it, it's that midweek refueling station that's so important, right? I mean, we should be refueling in the Word of God every day, but it's great to have a service in the middle of the week as extra, not a replacement for as extra. You know, I always say this, um, from a perspective of ministry, right? So many ministers fail because they actually take their time prepping to preach as their personal time with the Lord. And that's just not the case, right? That kind of stuff is over and above. We ourselves have to spend every day, just like everybody else, in the Word of God for ourselves, amen? And whether it's, it might be fortunate or unfortunate for you guys, but so often the correction we get is to pass down to all of us, right? So glory to God. So let's stand on our feet. Let's worship the Lord. And Father, we thank you for this time together, Father, in fellowship with each other and with you and your word, Father, and your word made flesh, Jesus, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, as we've come expecting to hear from you. And we can hear as we worship you, Father. I know you want to speak to hearts tonight, Father. And you know exactly where each and every one of us is at. You know our point of need, Father. And we ask you to meet us there. And we come to you tonight as touching this service, saying, have your way. Believing you for the anointing, Father. The anointing that will facilitate change in our lives, Father. And we thank you for the truth of your word, Father. The good news, Father, that sets the captive free. We thank you for meeting in each and every one of us, like we said, exactly at our point of need, because we're expecting it. And we've come expecting to hear you, and you will never disappoint us when we have that attitude. We thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You 
God, that's so true, right? There's nothing better than him, you know? He gave us all beauty for ashes, right? When we were dead to sin in our trespasses, right? God looked at us and said, my children are redeemable. And he put a plan in motion. And it's a plan that we're gonna talk about tonight, but it's a Jeremiah 29, 11 plan, a plan for a future and a hope, amen? And not the world's kind of hope, not a wishing, and maybe, but a certainty and an assurance that he who is faithful will perform his word and will watch over it. Amen? Glory to God. This is a song. We've done it once before, I think. And every time I hear this song, first time I really heard it, and I didn't even realize it was, it was a song by Bethel Music. I was out at Ramah, and I was just listening to the words of this song, right? And it's all about redemptive realities, where we're seated, right? We're seated in... In, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And when we get our minds around that and what goes along with being seated with Christ and the authority we have and the power that we have, there's not one thing the devil can throw our way that we can't overcome. Why? Because Jesus has already overcome it. Why? He's a champion. Amen. Glory to God. That's good news, church, right? This is my victory. You 
God. That's awesome, right? When you think of the words of that song, right? Seated in heavenly places with the one who has conquered it all. What does that mean? We can conquer it and have conquered it all. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. In the healing and 
the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know I couldn't see it There was Jesus Hallelujah, glory to God He's always right there with us, amen You know, so many times in our life you know, we'll say things, and I think I even alluded to this last week, like, Lord, where are you? And he says to us, I'm right here, right? Where are you? So glory to God. You guys may be seated. Um, we worship the Lord with our, our praise and our song, and we're going to continue to worship him with our giving. So if you guys need an envelope, raise up your hands, and Paul will make sure you guys get one. Amen? How many people know the Lord loves a cheerful giver? So I say, if you're going to give, you may as well be cheerful and happy about it. Amen? Glory to God. So let's believe God for a really good offering tonight. And for those of you at home, if you want to participate in our offering, you can accomplish that a couple different ways. You can text your offering to 732-479-8787, or you can go to our website, www. Was that four W's or was that three? That was three? I thought it was four. www.abundantgracechurch.com. Hit the giving tab, pull it down. You guys can take care of your giving there. Or if you're a fan of old-fashioned snail mail, you can send us a check here at the church, Abundant Grace Church, 108 Indian Head Road, Toms River, 08753. And uh, I think we've accomplished all the ways you can give. Amen. So glory to God. Let's hold up our offering. Um, I like to do that because you know what it does? It makes the devil mad. And that's a good thing. I'd like, to, I'd like to wake up in the morning and punch him in the eye. Right? We should. That's how we should start our day. Devil, you have no authority over me. I command you to flee from operation right now in Jesus' name, and that's a black eye. So glory to God. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to sow in your kingdom. We know it is you who's given us the ability to get wealth, so you may establish your covenant here in this earth, Father, and we thank you for that. And as those who've given out of a cheerful heart, Father, your word promises that it would return to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the multiplied return of the seed we've sown, and we thank you for blessings that are coming. It's not if, it's only when. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Paul, you may receive the offering. All right, so glory to God. We're going to uh, pick up where we left off last week. We started talking about and the title of the message was, I Need to See It. And you have your Bibles, turn over to Genesis chapter 12. Um, I need to see it. And it's not the world's way of seeing things, right? The world operates by sight, by feeling, by emotions, and are led by their flesh, right? And a lot of times they don't know that, but they don't believe anything unless they can basically, what was it, an old telephone commercial, reach out and touch someone? Well, they need to reach out and touch it for them to believe it. They need to see it in order to believe it. Now, we need to see it too, but not that context of the way the world does things. How do we need to see it? We need to see it in the Word of God. We need to see it through the eyes of faith. That Then and only then will we have what we're believing God for. We have to see it in the Word. We have to know it's ours. We have to reach out and receive it by faith, and then what happens? It manifests in our lives. And we started to look at last week, and I'm going to go back and do a little review, and then we're going to uh, pick up where we left off last week. So we looked at the story of Abraham. Abraham, the father of faith, right? Did he follow God the way I just talked about? Or did he say, hey, God, do me a favor, show me everything first, and then I'll step out and do it? No. And our scripture that we're going to read tells us that, right? So Abraham, or Abraham, uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And this is before he was Abraham. This was Abraham, right? And I'm going to probably call him Abraham because it just makes a lot easier to call him that. Because uh, if you try to go back and forth between his names, it gets difficult. But we know that God changed his name so that he could see himself the way God saw him. And through the eyes of the promise that he was given by God to be the father of many nations, which is what Abraham, that name, means. So every time he introduced himself, he was like, hi, I'm Abraham, the father of many nations. Think about that. 
What was he doing? He was speaking something out, right? He was speaking out the conf a confession that was in line with what the promise was that God had given him. He was speaking faith-filled words. So uh, Genesis chapter 12, let's start in verse 1. I'm reading this out of the New King James. says this, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to what? Oh, I got the plan. Here you go, Abraham. I'm giving you the whole plan. We've got easels, chalkboards, graphs. Here you go. No, go to a land I will show you. God operates that way today. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean for Abram? It means he's got to do something by faith and trusting in God that God will do what? Faithful to watch over his word and perform it. Well, what was his word given to Abram? Go to a land I will show you. Basically, he said to Abram, just get going. Just get going. You know, I think me and you were talking about this. Right? We even prayed this this morning. Lord, just show us the next step, right? I just need to know the next step. I don't need to show the end. I know what you've called me to do, right? But I don't know how you're going to get me there or us there, but I know you will. And all I need you to do is show me that next step. Same thing that's going on with Abraham. Go into a land, I will show you. And do what? I'm going to make you a great na nation. Hang on here a second, God. You know how old we are. My wife is barren. She can't have kids. How in the world are you going to make me a great nation? Have you ever had God put something on your heart and then you start reasoning with him why you can't accomplish what he's told you to do? My first foray, for lack of a better term, into ministry, I was fighting it, arguing with God, right? <laughs> I'm meeting my wife for lunch. I was cooking for the ministry. I think I shared a little of my testimony last week. I was cooking for the Celebrate Recovery Ministry. We lost our men's group facilitator, and I was living up at Homedale at the time. Jody was living down here with her parents. I was coming down to meet Jody for lunch one day, and I'm praying. Right, I'm praying, I'm about to get on the parkway. And it's one of those moments where it's you and God and it's personal and you remember exactly where you were when he spoke to you. And I was getting on the parkway at 114 in Homedale, coming over the overpass, about to hit the parkway south, and I was praying about this situation. I might have been praying the Holy Ghost. I don't think I was praying about this situation. And I was, and, and I was meditating on the fact that we just left, or our men's small group leader had left. And I was like, man, Lord, what are we going to do? And he goes, what do you mean, what are we going to do? You're it. And I went, <laughs> you got the wrong guy, God. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> call somebody. No, nope, not my thing, right? Not my thing, right? She's laughing because she knows the outcome. So I'm fighting it, I'm fighting it. I go to lunch with my wife that day. We went to where Rivoli's is now on, uh, on uh, Hooper. It's not Rivoli's, it was, wasn't Rivoli's back then. See, that's how, it's one of those days where you remember all the details. And I'm sitting having my lunch with my wife, we aren't my wife at the time, and we're talking about what just happened in the Celebrate Recovery meeting. And I'm like, yeah, Joe, what are we gonna do? She goes, well, you're it. <laughs> I said, pardon me? She didn't know, I didn't, hadn't shared with her what the Lord had just told me 35 minutes or 40 minutes before. I didn't share any of it with her. And she went to me, she goes, yeah, you're it. And I said, but, you know, me being the great man of faith, stood up and went, yup, I'll do it tonight. I was like, no, no, it ain't me. I am not doing that. Well, sure enough, after what, however long it was, I said, yes, sir, I'll do that. But God didn't show me how I was going to do it. He didn't show me how I, he didn't, I didn't feel equipped to do it. Abram, I'm sure, didn't feel equipped to get out of a land that was actually pretty good to him at the time to go where? To a place I'll show you? Lord, things are good. I don't want to. Does God want to stretch us and get us out of our comfort zones? I use the illustration of this, and we talked about this in Faith and Healing School a couple weeks ago. The man by the pool of Bethesda, right? Lying in that condition for years. What did Jesus tell him to do? Get up and pick up your mat. After he did what? Just got done telling Jesus all the excuses why he couldn't be healed. Jesus didn't ask him, Give me, why can't you be healed? Jesus made a statement or a question. He asked him a question. Do you want to be healed? 
Well, hang on, Lord. <laughs> you know, here's the reason why I can't. I'm cr- put it through your own life. Uh, hey, uh, Frank, uh, I want you to lead the Celebrate Recovery Men's Ministry. You're going to be the men's leader. Well, Lord, I can't do that. I'm not a... Jesus didn't ask that. The question was, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? Finally, the guy gets around him saying, yeah, I do. And Jesus tells him to what? Get up and pick up his bed. Well, what's a, I heard one minister say this, and it was powerful. What was the representation of his mat? It was a representation of his comfort zone. Get out of what you've always done over and over again, expecting a different result that wasn't working for you, because what? I want to stretch you now. I want to take you out of your comfort zone, because when you do that and you step out, you're stepping out in faith, now I can start to mold you and shape you, knowing that you trust me and I can trust you to do what I've asked you to do. There's a lot going on in that first couple of verses of Scripture. I'm going to make you a great nation. Yeah, I have no kids. My wife's old. It's never going to happen. Nope. That's not what he said. He didn't argue with God. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Think about Abram revolving this around his natural mind, going, how in the world is this going to happen? I don't even have a kid. Right? (laughs) Verse 5, so what did Abram do? He departed. As the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Right? And I know we looked at, I'm not going back there, we talked about what was Abraham doing. Well, Abraham was doing what Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6 was saying. He was trusting in the Lord with all his heart. Was he looking to what he could have understood in the natural? No. He was looking to what God said to him, knowing that God would be faithful. So he stepped out and did it. Because why? He trusted the Lord, and the Lord was going to provide. Sorry, could you say that again? She does that every, every time. No, I can't say it again. <laughs> but what do we need to know? What do we need to know that Abraham knew? God's plan, right? And we started to look, and I want to go a little deeper in looking at this because the Lord kind of spoke to my heart tonight, actually, while I was getting ready in the shower. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. And we all know that it should be a favorite verse of Scripture, everybody, right? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, the plans of a hope. I won't read it off here. The plans of a, of a, of. For I know the thoughts I have, I think, towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. But I wanted to read it out of the King James Version. Bonnie, can you put that up there? So the King James says it a little bit differently. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Who's doing the thinking here? God. Who's he thinking about? Me and you. Now, could you substitute your name in here? For I know the thoughts I think towards Jody towards Paul, towards Bonnie, right? Towards all of us. He's thinking about us. Was he thinking about Abram? Sure was. To do what? What he said in this verse of scripture. Of thoughts of peace, not evil. To give you an expected end. That word's important. When you, when you look up that word expect, expected end, and I have my, uh, my concordance right here on my phone, That word end is a word that means last, future, and posterity. Well, wait a second, posterity, interesting word. We've all heard it before. What does it mean? Your generations after you. God has a plan for you in him to do something for him to give you an expected end that's gonna pay dividends to generations to come. Now I got scripture that's not my opinion. Let's look at a scripture. Literally, I'm, I'm pulling my hair, and God's speaking to my heart, and I went, hmm, end. I never, really look, I never looked up the word end in the King James Version. It says posterity. Well, now turn over to, um, let's turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Let's go there. Galatians chapter 3. Okay, let's start in, I feel like Pastor Eddie, let's start in verse 10, but I'm going to read from verse, no, 
If you're watching, dude, I love you. You know that, right? Let's start reading in verse 10, right? Back in the New King James Version. Now, what did we say? God's promise, right, given through the prophet Jeremiah says, I got a plan for you specifically, a plan that's gonna be really good, peaceful, have an awesome outcome, and it's gonna pay dividends to generations. Now, was Abraham the father of many nations? And in and through him shall all nations be blessed. Well, is it the same promise that was given to Abraham that paid dividends for generations down the line for Abraham? Yes, it's the same promise, right? All right, so Galatians chapter three, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For what? The just shall live by faith. How is Abram living? By faith. Did that make him just? Did that, does that make us, when we live by faith, the righteousness of God in Christ? Sure does, right? Yet the law is not of faith, and the law wasn't of faith. The law was a tutor pointing the Jews for the need for a savior. Basically, it was a list, it was religion, right? It was religion putting together a list of rules and regulations of do's and don'ts. Well, glory to God, we're under a new and better covenant ratified and signed in the blood of Jesus Christ, right? No more rules and regulations with the law, just a personal, intimate relationship with God and Jesus Christ, right? Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has what? Redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I could stop there, and we could spend night after night, and we've done a series on Wednesdays, I think it went on for 10 weeks, about being redeemed from the curse. Glory to God, it's awesome. But guess what it is? It's part of the promise of God that's contained in Jeremiah 29, 11, that we receive how? By faith. Why? Let's go on. That the blessing of who? Abraham might come on who? The Gentiles in Christ. Are you a Jew? I'm not Jewish. What am I then? I'm a Gentile. What does it mean? I've been engrafted in the body of Christ. Along with faithful Abraham. And why? what did he do that we should all do? He stepped out in faith and followed God. Did it make sense? Probably not. I think many of us, if we think back to our own lives, when God's asked us to do something, did it make sense? No. I just feel I'm gonna tell a story. I've told it a lot, but I really just feel impressed to, to tell it. And don't say a word because it's a good story. <laughs> Me and my wife were going through some stuff years ago financially, and you know, I just say, see our testimony, which we don't really have all of, we have bits and pieces of it. Uh, going through some really challenging financial situations, and uh, I had no idea, you know, <laughs> but believe in God. St I should say, I shouldn't say believe in God, starting to learn how to believe God. It was fairly early on in our walk, but really here, plugged in, getting fed the word, and you know what? We all have to build our faith, right? And that's the stage we were in, and we're obviously we're continuing to try to and endeavoring to do that. But we're we're really trying to plug in the things of God, and outwardly things don't look so great, right? And I get a letter in the mail, and like serious financial stuff. And I get a letter in the mail, and it's from my insurance aid, my insurance, my life insurance company that. I actually, uh, insurance policy I'd gotten rid of, actually kind of lost it in my divorce when I had gotten divorced. And I don't even, like, why are they sending me a letter? This was like probably three or four years after this, all my divorce went down, it was been over for years, and I get a letter. Now, I'm trying to reason out in my own understanding how God's gonna deliver me and you to a degree, because we weren't married yet, but you were, we were kind of together. How in the world God's gonna deliver me this way? And I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm like, you watch, you'll see, you know, whatever. So I get this letter, 
and I, I happen to be friends, good friends with my insurance agent, and I call his secretary, and we did business and still do business together for years, and I call the secretary and I say, hey, Debbie, um, I got a letter from Guardian Life. I haven't had a policy with them. She knew the story. And I said, it says something on here. Now, I'm not going to leaving what it says for later. And she says, well, I'll tell you what, they keep that stuff really good. Their records department is awesome. So give them a call. I give them a call. Now, I'm trying to reason out how God's going to come through to meet this immediate urgent need that I had. Well, lo and behold, this letter from Guardian Life Insurance, I had apparently paid some premiums that weren't credited until after the policy was surrendered. And they said, oh, we have a refund for you. We have a refund. We have a check waiting for you for $10,000. Meanwhile, you know, Frank is thinking, well, maybe he'll, you know, he'll, I'll get more work, you know, I'll, and there's nothing wrong with that, obviously, and God will work through those channels, right? Or I'll do this, or I'll do that, or he'll do this. It came from an avenue that I could have never seen, right? But what does that go along with? Go to a land I will show you. Right? But we, and again, it's not always going to make sense. Quite often, it's not going to make any sense. But we have to be resigned to that Jeremiah 29 11 plan that God has for us, right? A plan for a hope. Bonnie, put that back up again if you could. Let's do the, the whatever version you want. That's okay. For I know the thoughts. And then we, we wrap our head around. We need to wrap it around that. God specifically gets up and want, is thinking about us every day. Thinking about us every day. Does he know all the hairs on our head? I don't know how many hairs were on my head. Why? Because we've been created in the image of Almighty God. But do we lead this lifestyle of faith, like believing Abraham, based on what we see, what we feel, no. How do we live it? By what's in the word of God through faith. Like I said when we started tonight, when we start believing it, then we'll see it. Not the world's way of I'll see it, then I'll believe it, right? Glory to God. I mean, it's, it's such, God doesn't overcomplicate things. But what do we do? overcomplicate ourselves. And really, what does it come down to? If we could boil this down to one word, the word is love. And it's God's love, right? God's love that once we finally get that true revelation of how good he is, then we have no problem trusting him when he asks us to do something that makes no sense. All we need to know is, Lord, you said it. I'm going to do it because your plan is a good plan. Can you say amen? amen? All right, so that was a little extra of what we talked about last week. So let's, let's continue our journey of looking at the father of faith, Abraham, and what he did. Um, so let's go over to Genesis chapter 13. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week. Did Abram miss it a little bit with what God told him to do? Depart from your family. Should he have taken good old Lot with him? That was his lot in life, literally, right? But did God make provision along the way for us to miss it? He did, right? He gave us 1 John 1, 9. Lord, I missed it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Now, what does what the word of God tells us? He throws that in the sea of forgetfulness, right? It's, it's done. But what do we so often need to do? Forgive ourselves. If we, and I've missed it plenty of times along this last 15 or 16 year journey, a lot. And I'll venture to guess, and I'm speaking this over myself, but the reality is I'm probably gonna miss it again. But does that mean, oh, that's it, you're done, it's over? No, it means what? You repent? Like Kenneth Copeland ever says, always says, go back. And try, to re and try to bring to your remembrance, and the Holy Spirit will do this for you, the last thing God asked you to do, and if you didn't do it, go back and do it, right? And keep trucking down the road with God. So, so we have Abram. God tells him, yep, head out of here, and he does. 
and uh, verse uh, 13, or chapter 13, verse 1. They, then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him, to the south. And Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold. He was blessed. He was blessed. And he, he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and then Abram called on the name of the Lord. Abram sought God. He was always looking to God. And if we, without reading every area where God asked him to do something, he was quick to do what God asked him to do. So key, right? Lot also went with Abram, verse 5, had flocks, herds, and tents. Now, was Lot prospering because Lot did what he was supposed to do? Or was Lot really prospering because he was hooked in to somebody that was being blessed by God? That's really important. Why is that really important to look at? Well, your blessing is tied to where you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to be with. You know, we could take that in the context of the local church. Specific believers belong in a specific body because we've been knit, the Word of God says we've been knit together for a specific body. To do what? Bring our talents and our gifts. There's so many believers that are out there church hopping, never finding a place to plant their roots deep. And it hurts my heart. I've seen it here over years. People I know in my heart of hearts, not to be judgmental towards them, because God certainly knows I've made lots of attempts to, to reach out to people and say, what are you doing? Not to judge them, but because my heart hurts, because God's shown things to me that they're supposed to be here, and their protection, and their prosperity, and their, their, um, their growth is tied to them being here. And then you see it. You see it often. Oh, they left here and went there. And then they stayed there for a little bit. And they went there. And then they went there. The unfortunate thing is, in these last of the last days, the Word tells us that men and women are going to want to heap to themselves ministers to just what? Tickle their ears with a message of what they want to hear which makes them feel okay about living the way they are and that will never facilitate the God kind of change in their lives. It will keep them stuck where they're at. And actually worse, because sin is pleasurable for a season, but what's the end all wages of sin? Death. And those itching ear messages are going to facilitate death in their lives because it's gonna keep them exactly where they are. I actually said this coming home from we were coming home from Greater Faith. We were driving home on the parkway in, the, in, the, tr in the, the van. And I turned around to Pastor Eddie and Melissa, my wife, and I said, you know what I finally realized after all these years? When you preach faith, some people get mad. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Don't you know what I'm going through? Sure do. Been there. But I know what the Word says. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You can't just, don't tell me what the Word says. Well, what do you want to hear? I want to hear what I want to hear. Make me feel better. I'm not going to make you feel better. The Word should make you feel better. Because when you wash your problem through the Word of God, there's an answer there for it. Faith makes people mad. Yeah. Right? Faith sometimes makes people mad. And you sit there and you go, Lord, it's, I don't understand it. And we don't need to understand it. But your Word isn't complicated. It really isn't. You know, it really isn't. We overcomplicate it, Right? All right, so where are we? We're with, with Lot, right? So Lot was blessed because he was hooked in with Abraham. How do we know that was the case? Because I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but when they parted ways, Lot didn't end up in a, in a good place. No, because why? He walked out of the anointing. He walked out of the blessing. He walked out of who he should have hung out with. Now, God told Abram, don't take your family, but he took him, and he was blessed because of Abraham. Right, and So that kind of shows me that God understands that Abram missed it, but you know what? I'm still blessing you, and I'm going to bless everybody that's with you, and he's hanging with you. You're blessed. 
Now, we see something start to happen here, right? And Abram called on the name of Har. Lot, Lot also went with Abram, had flocks, herds, tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great. Think about this. They were rich, right? So great that they could not dwell together. And as we get into this in verse 7, this was not between Lot and Abram, but it was between the people in their families and the people, their servants, right? And th there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Can Canaanites, the Perizzites, then dwelt in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, I don't want strife. Strife is a, is a tool from the enemy to cause division in every area that God wants to bless you in. He loves strife, right? He loves strife. He wants to put churches in strife. He wants to put marriages in strife. He wants to put children-parent relationships in strife. That word is an ugly word. I, didn't, I never realized how, like, when I say it, it makes my teeth cringe. Strife, strife. And I can tell you here, you know, we've talked about this a lot, that we endeavor to never let strife stand. Because the enemy wants to cause strife. You know, I, I read a book. Actually, it was Tony Cook's book. I shared it with you the other night. You know, as an as a associate pastor, and I'm not talking about anybody in specific. I'm just giving you a story. And this is very dangerous, very, very dangerous. And I was reading Tony Cook's book, In Search of Timothy. And that book is all about people in supportive ministry, ministry of helps, and specifically associate pastors, right? And, you know, you'll get people, like, I'll preach occasionally on a Sunday or here on a Wednesday, and you get people that come up to you and be like, oh, that was really good. You know, you should really talk to Pastor Eddie. You should, you should preach more. That's dangerous, that's dangerous. I am an associate pastor. What, what does that mean? Me and Jody are in submission to Pastor Eddie. That, that's, I don't want to hear that. It makes me very uncomfortable, right? And I'm glad you got something. But, and, and what am I saying? A lot of times that's out of a spirit of strife because people want to operate their own agendas. Look, the reality is, you get into churches. Some people just feel more connected to whoever, and that's okay, but not okay to the point where you cause strife and try to upset the apple cart so you can get what you want. Never works. Never works. And the reality is, it didn't take me too long to realize this, me and Pastor Eddie, just using us two as an example, there's many people that share the pulpit, but if you think about everybody that shares the pulpit here, we're all different. We're not similar. Why? Because we're different for a reason, right? We minister differently. I actually, when I hear myself sometimes, I actually think I'm more like Pastor Anthony was. You know, I have more of his characteristics and probably not so far-fetched since he was my father in the faith, right? And he was a lot like Pastor Hagen, you know? But the reality is when people start, oh, you know, you should do this and you should, that's strife. That's strife. That's a church killer. That's a church killer. What does it do? It causes division. And if you think it's not, when Tony, and I'm just, if you guys didn't read the book, I'm just going to share it a little bit because it's very important based on what we're talking about tonight. Tony Cook starts his book off by saying, using an illustration, he goes, well, there was a minister I knew, and he had a very large congregation. And here comes along part of it, one of his congregation, and thought he should have been in control and should have been in charge, and he split the congregation to a degree, right? Not, not in half, but he took a lot of people away from the congregation with him. And the pastor was left to say, you know, what am I going to do? You know, but soldiered on, and then eventually he passed down the church to his associate, and it flourished. And then Tony Cook goes on to say, well, you might be thinking I'm talking about a specific pastor, church, or ministry. No, he's talking about God himself. Strife. Strife. What did the devil do? Cause strife in heaven. It was the first church break. So it's not, we think it's, oh, we hear about it in churches. Oh, can you believe so-and-so left with half the congregation? Happened to God. 
Why? Who's the author of strife? The devil. Who's the associate God passed down the ministry to? Jesus. Who restored the church back to prosperity? Jesus. And we see it early on here with Lot. Now, it's important to realize this is 400 years before the law. There's a lot going on here, right? So, Perizzites dwell in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me. Now, who's the, who's the one getting blessed here? Lot's getting blessed, but it's an offshoot relationship that he has with Abram, right? And now Abram could have been like, dude, you're blessed because of me. God told me, you know, when people start saying God told me, just be careful, right? God told me to tell you, be even more careful, right? <laughs> I have a word for you. And many people have a word for you, but Remember the qualifiers. It's got to line up with the word. It's got to be edifying. And it's got to confirm something that's already on your heart yourself. Otherwise, it could just be emotion. Anyway, so Abraham could have said, hey, wait a second here. You're getting blessed because of me. You know, you go where I tell you to go. Did he say that? Right? He didn't say that. So Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. For we are brethren. Right? Right? Brethren, what do we call ourselves in the body of Christ? Brothers and sisters. We have to use an illustration of what Abram did when we're dealing with each other in Christ. Is not the whole land before you, right? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Abram said to Lot, you go where you want to go. But wait a second. Where they are, it was obvious what the better, more fertile land was. What does that show you? Abraham didn't care where Lot went because he didn't trust in what he saw. He trusted in where God was leading him to. Didn't matter to him. Lot, take the best land. God will move me on to the better land. That was his attitude, right? That was his attitude, right? Then I'll go to, and Lot lifted his eyes saw the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, which he would eventually wind up in, <laughs> like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and, let, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. Now, do we know anything about the land of Canaan? Do we know the prosperity that was contained in the land of Canaan? Well, what was going to happen some years later? That the, uh, that the Hebrews were going to come out of bondage in Egypt into what? The land of Canaan, which was what? A land flowing with milk and honey. What's milk and honey represent? Prosperity, provision of all kinds. Do you think God changed the land later on, or had the land always been that way? Because God created it, so it was that way. And Abraham went there, <laughs> right? And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent as far as Sodom, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said, verse 14, said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes. Now, a couple things are happening here. Should have Ab Abram taken Lot with him in the first place? No. So God gives him more of the vision after what he shouldn't have done was now rectified. He made, it became right, right? Now, we didn't know that they were going to go out, and I'm sure they didn't know that they were going to have an argument and things were going to, but God put it together that it was made right anyway, right? And the Lord said to Abram, after a lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants. What did we talk about in Jeremiah 29, 11? That word end meant posterity, so, which means your descendants. So God's plan for us is not only just about us. It's about our generations to come. If the Lord tarries, who knows? That could be 100 generations down the line that the Lord wants to bless. But it's got to start with our faithfulness. To do what? Step out in faith. Step out in faith. 
You know, we pray every morning for our kids and our grandchildren and our descendants that aren't born yet, that they're all saved, blessed, and walking in their divine calling. You know, I used to think this, and we're going to close with this because I want to get ahead of and get into something a little bit more, but I grew up in a great household. I had great parents, right? And taught from a young age. I could do whatever I wanted to do. Then after spending time in the Word of God, I realized that's not the case. We can't do whatever we want to do. We got to endeavor to do what God wants us to do. You know, not too long ago, 16, 17, 18 years ago, the last place in the world I would have seen myself was here. <laughs> and you knew me then, right? You knew me back then, and I was... I was making the devil happy, you know, for real. I mean, I'm just, it just was the truth, you know. Pastor Eddie always shares a little bit of his testimony. Grew up in it, right? Walked away from it, came back to it. I didn't grow up in it. So I knew I was called young. My family were the, you know, the, the church-going people that would go for holidays, and they'd try to get a streak going for a couple weeks, and then that wouldn't work. You know, I always use the illustration of what my friends always did, go to the, uh, the church parking lot, steal the bullet, and then tell your parents you went to church. You know, here it is, Mom, I went to church, right? <laughs> right. But my point being is when we start to see God's providence in our life, we start to see, and, you know, it's always there. His call is always there, right? He's really spoken to everybody that's heard the gospel message has been spoken to by God. And this rocked my world when Brother Keith Moore said this when he was here. You know, God's never going to mess with free will. He says to us, I set before you life and death. Choose life. It's an open book test. He gives us the answer. But you'd be like, God, wasn't it your desire that all would be saved? Absolutely is his desire. And I always wondered, Lord, why? Why, why can't everybody be saved? His not messing with free will is actually, and this is what Brother Keith Moore said, I don't know, it was the last time he was here, it was the last time he was here, that him not messing with our free will is not the ultimate act of love. I'm not, I love you so much, I'm, you decide. If this is the way you want to live and spend eternity in hell, I have to love you enough for you to make your decision. Have we ever said stuff like that to our kids? Look, I love you so much, I'm going to let you go. Right? How many times in Celebrate Recovery we'd minister to parents whose kids were dealing with drugs and stuff? Got to kick them out of the house. I know it's harsh. No, it sounds hard. But this enabling them is going to keep them going down the same road. They're never going to change. But I'm afraid. Then do it afraid. Right? Think about that, right? And, well, let's stop there. I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to continue. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword pointing us into a direction of change, Father. And we thank you, Lord, as we hook into your promises, the Jeremiah 29, 11 promises, a peace, a hope, a future, and an end that in and through us all nations shall be blessed, meaning our kids, our descendants, everybody we come into contact with. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. So glory to God. Thank you guys for joining us. You guys live stream as well. Don't forget, Faith and Healing School tomorrow and Friday. 10.30 a.m., and we look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So this is Pastor Frank. We love you guys. Have an awesome rest of your Wednesday evening.